Today, we will learn and reflect on the histories of Herodotus covering the Greco-Persian Wars under King Darius, then his son, King Xerxes, where the greatly outnumbered Greek city-states successfully defeated the mighty Persian army and navy to keep the Greek city-states free. Just as in the Iliad, the Greek soldiers and sailors in the histories of Herodotus fight for Cleos for glory. And warriors in these warrior societies are immortalized by their great and marvelous deeds on the battlefields. So why did Herodotus write his histories? Herodotus tells us why he wrote his histories in his first paragraph. So that human achievements may not be forgotten in time, and great and marvelous deeds, some displayed by Greeks and some by barbarians, may not be without their glory, and especially to show why the two peoples fought with each other. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources we use for this video and the additional lessons we can learn from these sources and my blogs that cover this topic. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. In the first four books of the histories, Herodotus treats us to a tour and snippets of the histories of Persia and its conflicts with Scythia and Egypt. But the last five books are the more familiar history of the Greco-Persian Wars. When we compare the dates of the two main wars of the Greek world, we realize that the Greco-Persian Wars end only a few decades before the start of the larger Peloponnesian War between Athens and Greece. Likewise, Herodotus was only a few decades younger than Thucydides, who with Xenophon recorded the history of the Peloponnesian War. They could have been acquaintances, although history does not recount any meetings between them. Now we need to understand how the Greeks and Persians fought on land and at sea to understand the battles in the Greco-Persian Wars. The greatest difference was in training. The Greeks by far had the best trained hoplite infantry and trireme naval forces in the ancient world. Hoplites fought in tight formation, interlocking shields in the left hand. Long spears and swords yielded in the right hand, which they used to poke through the lines of the enemy. Hoplite soldiers were drawn from the middle and upper classes. They had to purchase the hoplite armor, helmet, shield, breastplate, and greaves for the legs. Hoplite soldiers needed constant drilling and conditioning, and the Spartan hoplite infantry soldiers were full-time soldiers but many other Greek city-states, in particular Athens, Plataea, Corinth, and Thebes, had equally skilled hoplite soldiers, most likely training monthly, much like our army reserve units, we suspect. If two Greek city-states fought and both their hoplite forces kept in formation, often the contest was a draw, but if one side broke rank and fled, the fleeing troops were often massacred, which led to some very lopsided casualty counts. In contrast, the Persian infantry were not as well trained, but had a wicker shield, short spear, sword, and a bow and arrow. They were no match for the Athenian hoplite, but the Persian force included cavalry forces and archers. But these were most effective when fighting on flat plains, whereas much of Greece is hills and mountains. Herodotus does not mention any Greek Ionian hoplites fighting for the Persians, and he hints that the Greek Ionians may have lost their fighting spirit under Persian subjugation and the mostly mercenary infantry forces of the Persians were no match for the highly disciplined and motivated Greek hoplite troops as this picture depicts. Now discussing the naval forces, the triremes had three long stacked rows of rowers who had to row in unison with a heavy ram below the water line at the front of the ship. A typical trireme had about 170 rowers plus a handful of hoplite infantry ready on deck. The favored strategy was to ram the middle of the opposing ship, sinking it, or quickly try to pass closely to the opposing ship, withdraw your oars in unison, and shear off the oars of the opposing rowers. Once ships were entangled, then the hoplite soldiers could board them and engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Greek navies fighting on both sides rode triremes, and several references in Herodotus states that it was difficult to tell them apart in the thick of battle. These naval fighting strategies required even more drill and conditioning. The Athenian navy were likely serving full time so they could maintain the conditioning required to row in unison during a day-long battle. Slaves were never employed as rowers in the ancient world. Since rowers did not need to purchase any equipment, many were from the lower classes. 
and the existence of this large lower to middle class navy favored the development of democracy in Athens. And here we have a photograph of a modern recreation of a trireme. And when Greek college students trained as rowers, this trireme turned out to be quite agile with very impressive acceleration. And we also show here the reigns of the kings of Persia, and we see that both King Darius and his son Xerxes each reigned for about three decades, which was a long reign in the ancient world. And we can also see that King Xerxes reigned for over a decade after the end of the Greco-Persian Wars in 449 BC, so maybe they weren't quite as disastrous as Herodotus leads us to believe. The histories of Herodotus were meant to be read aloud. Ancient books never contain battle maps and graphics. Historical reconstructions are based on clues from the ancient written sources of the battle, plus a knowledge of the geography and the archaeology of the battlefield. Plus, ancient audiences already have a general understanding of how all the major battles progressed. But Dr. Wikipedia can help modern readers on exactly how we think the battles progressed. The Greco-Persian Wars begin with conflicts in Ionia, here in Orange, which is the Greek-speaking West Mediterranean coast of the Persian Empire in what is today Turkey. It is in Ionia that Athens first antagonizes the Persian King Darius, giving him an excuse to mount a quick raid on Greece, hoping to add it to his empire. Early in the fifth book, the Persian general Megabazus sent to King Amentus of Macedonia a demand for earth and water, as a sign of his submission to Darius. Now Macedonia was in northern Greece and close to Turkey. Its closeness to Persia meant that this was a wise concession indeed. The demand was not refused, and Amantus invited the seven Persian envoys to a magnificent dinner, entertaining them most hospitably. Now after dinner, while the wine was still going around, one of the Persians said, At important dinners like this, my Macedonian friend, it is our custom in Persia to get our wives and mistresses to come and sit with us in the dining room. Now the footnotes confirm this was not a Persian custom. Amantus was concerned but cautious, but not his headstrong son, Alexander, who suggested his father allow him to entertain these Persians. Now Amantus warned him, I beg you not to do these men any mischief, for if you do, you will ruin us all. Have the courage to endure the sight of their behavior. As for myself, I will leave the room as you suggest. So, Prince Alexander turned to the Persian envoys and said, My friends, these women are entirely at your service. You may take to bed any of them whom you choose. Indeed, you can bet all of them. You only have but to say the word. Now, however, as it is nearly bedtime, and you are, as I observe, agreeably primed with drink, perhaps you will allow me to send them away to take a bath after which you may have them again. And we see the themes in Herodotus and indeed Homer in the Iliad, which always comes back to how hubris can make the gods angry, and how they can withdraw their support of the endeavors of men, and how the arrogance of hubris can humble even the bravest of warriors. And we also see how the Persians are no longer the warrior race they once were under King Cyrus, how they've grown soft, how they've lost the warrior spirit, how they disregard the fighting spirit of the Greeks at their own peril. And we see how the Persians do not keep up their guard in meetings where they must dine with the enemy in hostile enemy camps, a danger we explored in our video on the Iliad. So when Prince Alexander brought out the fresh and ladies to his Persian envoy guests, they did not notice that under the flowing robes were not pretty young ladies but rather young warriors armed with sharpened knives. Herodotus tells us that was the end of the Persian envoys to Macedon and of their servants too, and of carriages and a great deal of baggage of every kind. They all disappeared together. Now evidently the Persian commander Bubaris was impressed by this brave show of defiance because Amantus kept the affair dark by giving Bubaris a large sum of money and his own sister Gaije. In this way, the murder was hushed up and never discovered. Now, the most impetuous Prince Alexander of Macedon was a distant ancestor of another impetuous monarch, Alexander the Great, who conquered Persia and part of India a century and a half later. And now we'll discuss the beginning of the evils for the Greeks and the barbarians, and that is the ships that were the beginnings of evil. 
as Herodotus says. The Persians had already conquered the many Greek colonies on the western Mediterranean shores of Asia Minor. Many of these Greeks wanted to be free of Persian domination. Aristagoras of Miletus traveled to Sparta speaking to their assembly. We beg you in the names of the gods of Greece to save from slavery your Ionian kinsmen. It will be an easy task, for these foreigners have little taste for war, and you are the finest soldiers in the world. The Persian weapons are bows and short spears. They fight in trousers and turbans, and that shows how easy they will be to beat. Now, he must not have realized that the Spartans are, well, Spartan, little influenced by promises of wealth, for he continues, The Persians have everything, gold, silver, bronze, elaborately embroidered clothes, and beasts of burdens and slaves. Now, King Cleomenes of Sparta stopped Aristagoras from saying any more of the road to the Persian regional capital, city of Susa. My Elysian stranger, you must leave Sparta before sunset. Your proposal to take Lacedaemonians to a three months journey from the sea is a highly improper one. Spartans do not possess the hubris generated by greed. Now at the public assembly at Athens, Aristagoras had more luck, reminding them that his Miletians were descended from Athenian colonists. And so the Athenians sent 20 ships to Ionia under the command of Melanthias, a distinguished Athenian. In their brief adventure, the Athenians landed in Miletus and then attacked Sardis, burning it to the ground. In the conflagration of Sardis, the temple of Cybebe, a goddess worshipped by the natives, was destroyed, and the Persians later made this as a pretext for their burning of Greek temples when they invaded Greece. In the ensuing battle with the enraged Persians, the Greeks were badly beaten, and after this battle, the Athenians would have nothing to do with the Ionian rebellion. After the death of Aristagoras, the Ionian rebellion continued. The Persians gathered a fleet to defeat the Ionian rebels. But to defeat the Persians, the Ionian fleet, assembled from all the unruly city-states of Ionia, had to fight as a disciplined unit. So, the Phocan commander Dionysus was chosen to whip them into fighting shape. Herodotus tells us, Every day he had ships and crews out for training, making the fleet sail in line ahead, keeping the troops on board under arms, practicing the oarsmen on the maneuver of breaking the line to shear off the oars of their opponents or ramming and sinking them. Thus the men got no rest from morning to night. And after many days the men started to grumble. What god have we offended to be punished like this? Anything would be preferable to the misery we now endure if it is a choice between two sorts of slavery. Then the one we are threatened with, however bad it turns out to be, can hardly be worse than what we are putting up with now. Let now then let us refuse to obey his orders. And it was no sooner said than done. Every seaman in the fleet refused duty. They lounged about in the shade and refused to go aboard their vessels or continue their training in any way whatever. So this is the equivalent of the foolish teenagers who ask themselves, why study? Why go to college? Why not party? The Persians did come, but to win in naval battles in the ancient world requires drilled and disciplined rowers. The Ionians refused to do the work that Athenian crews accepted as their lot, and they were roundly defeated by the Persians and then enslaved. So ended the Ionian revolt. And in his first attempt to invade Greece, King Darius sailed his fleet close to shore following his marching army. When they reached Mount Athos, they encountered treacherous winds. The winds blowing off the high mountain down to the sea can be fierce. Rodas tells us, When the ships rounded the promontory, they were caught by a violent northerly gale, which proved too much for the ships. Many were driven ashore and wrecked on Mount Athos. Reports say 300 ships were lost with over 20,000 men. The sea in by Athos is full of monsters. And the ships that were not dashed upon the rocks were seized and devoured. Many men, unable to swim, were drowned. Others died of cold. Perhaps these monsters were sharks. The Persian army also faced heavy casualties when the Brigi, a Thracian tribe, attacked their camp at night. Herodotus tells us the whole force returned to Asia in disgrace. King Darius instructed his servant to whisper in his ear each time he sat down for dinner, Remember Athens. When King Darius invaded Greece again in another campaigning season, the navy cut across the seas to avoid the treacherous winds blowing off Mount Athos. 
As he marched down the Greek coast, many cities showed submission by giving earth and water. Others were put under siege and subdued. The Persians decided to disembark at Marathon, and the Athenian hoplites hurried to meet them. The Athenians sent their runner Pheidippides to Sparta. His message was, Men of Sparta, the Athenians ask you to help them and not to stand by while the most ancient city of Greece is crushed and enslaved by a foreign invader. But the Spartans were in the middle of a religious festival. They said they could not take the field until the moon was full, as they did not wish to break their religious law. The Athenians would have to face the Persians alone, assisted only by a contingent from Plataea, which is a small city-state northwest of Athens. The Athenians and the Plataeans were outnumbered. Their center was weak since they had to extend their infantry hoplite line to match the Persian line. For some reason, the Persians did not deploy their cavalry. Maybe they were still on the ships, or maybe the marshes on both sides of the battlefield made cavalry useless. Rodotus tells us, the Persians, seeing the attack developing at the double, prepared to meet it, thinking it suicidal madness for the Athenians to risk an assault with so small a force, rushing in with no support from either cavalry or archers. Well, that was what they imagined. Nevertheless, the Athenians came on, closed with the enemy all along the line, and fought in a way not to be forgotten. They were the first Greeks, so far as we know, to charge the enemy at a run, and the first who dared to look without flinching at Persian dress and the men who wore it, for until that day came, no Greek could even hear the word Persian without terror. Well, when the Athenians hoplites charged them at a rush, the mercenary Persian infantry panicked. They were so shocked that they would do this. While well, modern scholars have debated, could Athenian hoplites really charge at a run for over a mile and then fight the Persians in a pitched battle? Well, it just so happens that many college professors are not versed in military tactics, because all they needed to do is ask a soldier who'd gone through basic training in the U.S. Army. That's what you do in basic training. You charge for a mile with 100 pounds on your back, and then you fight in the battle. Well, anyway, the Athenian center was pushed back, but then the Athenian wings advanced, trapping the Persian enemies. Triumphant, they chased the routed enemy and cutting them down until they came to the sea, and men were calling for fire and taking hold of the ships. Over 6,000 Persians were slaughtered, but the Athenians only lost several hundred men, or so Herodotus says. All of these casualties may have been exaggerated. The losses were lopsided when an opposing army broke formation and fled. The Athenians captured seven ships, but the rest sailed off to attack the undefended city of Athens. Now, after fighting all day, the Athenians then hurried back at a run with all possible speed to save their city and succeeded in reaching it before the arrival of the Persians. And this was like a seven or ten mile run. And when the Persian fleet appeared, it lay at anchor for a while, surprised by the arrival of the Greek army that they had just fought. And then the ships sailed back to Asia. Since he had led the forces to overthrow his hapless predecessor, King Darius was a warrior king like his predecessor, King Cyrus, although he became soft as he enjoyed the wealth and luxury of the Persian court. Now his son, King Xerxes, was the first Persian king whose entire life was spent at court surrounded by luxury and sycophants. It was unthinkable for him to lead the Persian troops in battle. Rather, he would sit on throne-like days built for him to observe the tides of battle, much like he was a spectator at the Olympic Games with a ringside seat, which meant that his army and navy were more concerned about impressing the great king with their bravery than executing sound tactical maneuvers that win battles. King Darius spent three years preparing for another invasion of Greece when a revolt broke out in Egypt, and he died during the Egyptian campaign. His son Xerxes turned his attention back to Greece after putting down the Egyptian rebellion. So this invasion was launched seven years after Marathon. And the characters of Herodotus remind the Persian kings over and over again that they underestimate the Greeks at their peril. King Xerxes called a meeting to debate whether to invade Greece once again. Embedded in his long speech egging on King Xerxes, his general Mardonius asks this, Have we anything to fear from the Greeks? The size of their army, their wealth. The question is absurd. We know how they fight, and we know how slender their resources are. 
And there's an interesting moral lesson when Artabanus argues against invading Greece. Herodotus believes that it is an act of hubris to underestimate and slander your opponents. Artabanus addresses Mardonius. By slandering the Greeks, you increase the king's eagerness to make war on them, as this is the very thing you most passionately desire. Heaven forbid it happen. Slander is a wicked thing. The slanderer is guilty of speaking ill of a man behind his back, and the man who listens to him is guilty in that he takes his word without bothering to find out the truth for himself. Now, Artabanus warns Xerxes that the size of his forces and the great distance to Greece may work against him. Let me tell you, my king, of your other great enemy, and that is the land. Even if you meet with no opposition, the land itself will become more and more hostile to you the further you advance, drawn on and on. The mere distance by itself will ultimately starve you. Although his army was not the two and a half million, as Herodotus states, it surely numbered close to a hundred thousand, or maybe more, and feeding that large a host was a challenge in the ancient world and Herodotus tells of his army drinking dry the streams in their path. Now Xerxes counters this with some Dale Carnegie responses. I would much rather take a risk and run into trouble half the time than keep out of trouble by being afraid of everything. And also, it was by taking risks that my ancestors brought us to where we stand today. Only by great risks can great results be achieved. Now, the army and navy that Xerxes would march and sail to Greece would be many times larger than the army of Darius the Greeks defeated, and the preparations for war would be more thorough than before. Xerxes decided to cut a canal across the isthmus at Mount Athos so his ships could avoid the treacherous seas at the tip of the peninsula that doomed Darius's first expedition. Now, many historians had viewed this as another lie told by Herodotus until archaeologists found the buried remains of this ancient canal. Now, Herodotus thinks this is hubris. It was mere ostentation that made Xerxes have the canal dug. He only wanted to show his power and to leave something to be remembered by. The canal was wide enough for two triremes to pass side by side, so it was a decent-sized canal. Now Herodotus accuses Xerxes of other acts of hubris against nature when he lashed boats together at the Dardanelles, and that's the strait between Europe and Asia, tying planks on the decks to form a bridge from Asia to Europe. Herodotus tells us the work was successfully completed, but a storm of great violence smashed it up and carried everything away. Here again, the gods are punishing hubris. Xerxes was very angry when he learned of the disaster and gave orders that the Hellespont should receive 300 lashes and have a pair of fetters thrown into it. And, as we learned in the Iliad, the Greeks believed that every lake and waterway was inhabited by a god. Now, King Xerxes sent envoys to the Greek cities demanding earth and water to show their submission. But Xerxes sent no demand for submission to Athens or Sparta because of what happened to messengers sent by Darius previously. At Athens, these envoys were thrown into the pit like criminals. And at Sparta, they were thrown into a well and told if they wanted earth and water for the king that they could dig them out from the well by themselves. The Athenians were worried they saw no way to block the Persian army from putting Athens under siege and breaching the walls of Athens. The Athenians sent envoys to consult the oracle of Delphi and the princess of Apollo uttered this prophecy. Why sit you, doomed ones? Fly to the world's end, leaving home in heights your city circles like a wheel. All is ruined, for fire and the headlong god of war, speeding in a Syrian chariot, shall bring you low. Now, the complete response is even more depressing, but they didn't want to surrender to Persian might. That was not the message the Athenians wanted to bring back to their fellow citizens. So they approached the oracle a second time, olive branch in hand, so the priestess uttered a second prophecy. Zeus the all-seeing grants to Athene's prayer that the wooden wall shall not fall, but help you and your children. But await not the host of horse and foot coming from Asia, nor be still, but turn your back and withdraw from the foe. Truly a day will come when you will meet him face to face. Divine Salamis, you will bring death to women's sons when the corn is scattered or the harvest gathered in. So what does that mean? Well, this less threatening second prophecy would be the one read to the Athenian assembly. Some older men thought that the wooden wall meant they could build a palisade on the Acropolis 
which was a temple complex built on the rocky hills in the middle of Athens. Now we will consult Plutarch on the response of the leading Athenian citizen, Themistocles. He forcibly argued that the wooden wall could only refer to their fleet of triremes, and that is why the god had called Salamis divine, rather than dreadful or cruel, because it was destined to become synonymous with a piece of good fortune for Greece. And the decision was made to abandon Athens, as the Athenians could not withstand a Persian siege. The Athenian men would board their triremes while the women, children, and slaves would be sent as temporary refugees to the nearby Peloponnese city-state of Trozen, taking whatever property with them that they could, leaving Athens nearly deserted. Now one detail told by Plutarch that Herodotus did not mention was that helpless older citizens and domestic animals had to be left behind. Whether the Persians slaughtered them or not is hard to say. Herodotus says that the Athenians sent their women, children, and slaves to the island of Salamis. Quite likely, the Athenians evacuated their families to both places, and whatever other Greek city-state was putting up unfortunate refugees from the war, as the Persians had already torched many other Greek city-states. Athens was able to challenge the Persian fleet only because, several years before, when the Athenian myers at Laurium struck a rich vein of silver, Themistocles persuaded the Athenian assembly not to distribute this windfall to the citizenry as a dividend, but to instead use the money to build a fleet of 200 triremes for the war they were waging against their neighbors, who controlled the sea because of their fleet. Themistocles did not have to wave Darius or the Persians at them. Their distance made their coming seem a remote prospect at that time. Now, Plutarch also notes that Themistocles' greatest achievement was to end all the inner Greek fighting and get the various states to come to terms with one another by persuading them that their hostilities to one another should take second place to the war with Persia. Now, the Greek forces discussed where to best check the advance of the Persian multitudes through Greece, and the decision was to make a stand at the narrow coastal pass at Thermopylae, northeast of Athens. Today, Thermopylae stands on a coastal plain, but in ancient times, the water level was higher, so the pass was narrower, 50 feet wide in some place, narrow enough in other places to only let a single wagon pass through. Herodotus tells us that here the Persians would be unable to use their cavalry or take advantage of their numbers, so it is here that the Greeks determined to make their stand. And the plan was that the Spartans and allied forces would face the Persians on land at Thermopylae, and the Athenian triremes would face the Persian fleet near the island of Salamis. What did the oracle advise the Greeks? Pray to the winds, for they will be good allies to Greece. And the winds were good allies. The Persian fleet was caught in a heavy blowing wind from the east called the Hellespontian, which raised a confused sea like a pot on a boil. The storm was very violent, and there was no chance of riding it out. The Persians lost about 400 ships, about a third of their fleet, in this storm, improving the odds for the Athenian fleet. Xerxes sent a man on horseback to report back on the activities of the Spartan force at Thermopylae. He was astonished to see some Spartans stripped for exercise while others were combing their hair. Now, Xerxes asked Demartus, who was an exiled Spartan king in his service, what this meant, and he answered him. It is the custom of the Spartans to pay careful attention to their hair when they are about to risk their lives. Now Xerxes just could not understand why such a small number of warriors would dare stand up to his mighty army, so he waited four days for the Greeks to flee. Now then the troops that he sent against the Spartans were defeated with heavy casualties. So he then sent in his picked troops, the king's immortals, who fought the Greeks to a standstill on the fifth day. Herodotus tells us that for the Spartans it was a memorable fight. They were men who understood war pitted against an inexperienced enemy. Among the feints they employed was to turn their backs in a body and, and pretend to be retreating in confusion, goading the enemy to pursue with a great clatter and roar. But then the Spartans, just as the Persians were upon them, would wheel and face them and inflict in the new struggle innumerable casualties. The Spartans had their losses too, but not too many. At last, the Persians, finding their assaults on the pass were useless, broke off the engagement and withdrew. Now Xerxes was watching the battle where he sat, 
and it's said that during the attacks, in terror for his army, three times he leapt to his feet, and the next day's battle went the same way. Then a traitor revealed for gold a mountain trail that bypassed the pass so nobly defended. When the Spartans realized that they would be fighting Persians on both sides and were thus doomed, the Spartan king Leonidas ordered all Confederate troops to flee to fight another day, and a small contingent of Spartans, Thebans, and Thespians resolved to face the Persian army to their deaths. The next morning, when the Persians attacked, many of the barbarians fell. Behind them, the Persian commanders plied their whips indiscriminately, driving the men on. Many Persians fell into the sea and drowned. Still more were trampled to death. No one could count the number of the dead. The Greeks, knowing that death was inevitable, fought with strength and fury and desperation. By this time, most of the spears were broken, and they were killing Persians with their swords. In the course of the fight, Leonidas fell, having fought most gallantly, and many distinguished Spartans with him. Like an often sung songs of the battles in the Iliad, in this battle Herodotus tells us that there was a bitter struggle over the body of Leonidas. Four times the Greeks drove the enemy off, and at last by their valor rescued the body. As their numbers grew smaller, the Greek perimeter shrunk, but the Greeks resisted to their last, with their swords if they had them, and if not, with their hands and teeth until the Persians, coming on from the front over the ruins of the wall and closing in from behind, finally overwhelmed them with missile weapons. And this was such a memorable battle that the Greek dead were buried where they fell. And over them is this inscription, 4,000 here from Pelops' land against 3 million did stand. And also the Spartans have a special epitaph. It runs, Go tell the Spartans you who read, We took their orders and here lie dead. Xerxes then commits an outrage of hubris not pleasing to the gods. Xerxes went to the battlefield to see the bodies and ordered the head of King Leonidas to be cut off and fixed on a stake. Now the Persians lost no time in invading Attica and the nearly empty city of Athens, laying a siege on the wooden walls built on the Acropolis, quickly overwhelming those old Athenians trusting in these walls, looting and burning Athens and all her temples. But booty of another kind was not to be found, as no concubines could be seized. The women and children were nowhere to be seen. You know, later, when the tides of war shifted to the Greeks, the Spartans' noble stand at Thermopylae, like the Alamo, would inspire them in their battles against the Persians, and would also inspire historians over the centuries and the millennia. But the effect on the Greeks the day after the battle was just despairing. Some Greeks were wanting to sail their triremes to the Isthmus to defend the Spartan lands of the Peloponnese. And the Athenian playwright Aeschylus fought at Marathon and may have also fought at Salamis. And we render his emotional eyewitness account of this fierce naval battle in its own separate video. Themistocles grasped that the best chance for the Greeks to prevail would be to fight in the cramped straits of Salamis. He made a speech to the troops and likewise tried to convince the other commanders that sticking together and fighting at Salamis was the best strategy, but he had doubts that everyone would agree. So he sent a message to the Persian commander telling him that he was on his side and that the Persians that night needed to bottle up the Greek fleet in the Straits of Salamis. And we quote Herodotus in our video on the Battle of Salamis. This was also brilliant tactically for the Greek naval forces had the benefit of a sound night's sleep, while the Persians spent their night before the big battle bobbing on the waves, bottling up the Greeks, and not getting a wink of sleep. Now, can you imagine pulling an all-nighter and then having to row and fight all day long with little to eat and drink under the bright hot sun? And this is what happens when a hubristic potentate decides how battles will be fought. Herodotus brings us to the morning of the battle. At dawn, the fighting men were assembled, and Themistocles gave his finest speech. He compared all that was best and worst in human nature and fortune, and an exhortation to choose the better. Finishing, he ordered the men to embark onto their ships. The whole fleet got underway, and in a moment, the Persians were upon them. The Greeks checked their way and began to back astern. And they were on the point of running aground when an Athenian ship drove ahead and rammed an enemy vessel, seeing the ships locked together. The rest of the ships hurried to assist, and the general action began. 
Now the painting gives you an idea of the confusion in the narrow straits. The better disciplined Athenian crews made short work of the Persians who panicked. The Persians who fought foolishly rather than tactically, seeking either to flee or to please the great king Xerxes who was watching the battle. For the Persians, it was every man to himself. There was no coordinated actions. A large portion of their fleet were sunk. A large portion of the Persian sailors and soldiers drowned. The Persians had landed troops on the island of Salamis to slaughter any Greeks who swam there, but instead these troops were also massacred. After the battle, one advisor told Xerxes that he had achieved his main objective, that he had invaded and burned the empty city of Athens. And so General Mardonius tells Xerxes, If you made up your mind not to stay here, then go home together with the greater part of the army, and I will make it my duty, with 300,000 picked troops, to deliver Greece to you in chains. And this gave a way for Xerxes to return home without losing too much face. And this also rid Mardonius of the unproductive elements of the army. But the march back to Persia was difficult. Herodotus relates, During the march, the troops lived off the country as best they could, eating grass where they found no grain, and stripping the bark and leaves off trees of all sorts, cultivated or wild, to stay their hunger. Plague and dysentery attacked them. Many died, and others who fell sick were left in the various towns along the route. Now, we know Herodotus exaggerates, but we also know that city-states on the way home were less likely to assist soldiers of a defeated army. Herodotus also describes how much of the remaining Persian fleet was destroyed in an odd land battle on an Ionian island. The Persians had no stomach for battling the Athenians at sea, so they pulled their triremes on land and threw up a palisade around their ships. The Athenians breached this palisade and massacred most of the Persians. You know, back to the army, General Mardonius was now stuck in Greece with no clear objective and no clear timetable, although his hand-picked 300,000 troops were a clear threat as they heavily outnumbered the Greek armies. So the Persian army wintered with their ally Thessaly in northern Greece. Amazingly, Mardonius sent an ambassador to address the Athenians. He told them that he had a message from King Xerxes, and Xerxes supposedly telling the Athenians, I am willing to forget all the injuries which Athens has done to me. So Mardonius, first give the Athenians back their land, and let them take whatever territory they wish, and be self-governing. If they are willing to come to terms with me, you are to rebuild the temples which I burnt. And then the ambassador added, Xerxes' power is superhuman, and his arm is long. So how did the Athenians respond to the superhuman Xerxes, who so recently fled Greece after many of his ships were sunk at Salamis? And so the Athenians answer, Now tell Mardonius that so long as the sun keeps its present course in the sky, we Athenians will never make peace with Xerxes. On the contrary, we will oppose him unremittingly, putting our trust in our gods and heroes he despised, whose temples and statues he destroyed with fire. Now when spring came, the Persians invaded Athens again, torching what had not yet been torched, and again the Athenians took to their ships, and again their women and children and valuables were evacuated to neighboring communities and islands. It must have been disheartening for these invading Persians to invade Athens with no booty, no gold, no silver, no concubines, it's no nothing. Uh, the Persians could not force the Athenian hoplites to face them in battle, and they could not invade the Peloponnese to fight the Spartans, because they would first need to cross the narrow isthmus at Corinth, and the Persians just did not have the stomach to attempt another Thermopylae. The Persians built an army camp on the plains of Boeotia in central Greece, where they could deploy their cavalry. The Greeks were not going to engage the Persians on the plains. Instead, they held the high ground where the Persians refused to engage them. Some Persian raiding parties had succeeded in fouling a spring the Greek forces used for water and had captured a baggage train carrying food. So the Greeks tactically withdrew to a more hospitable neighboring province of Plataea. The Persians thought they were giving up, so they pursued them. But the Greeks turned around and bettered the Persians in battle, who then retreated behind the palisades of their army camp. In the battle, General Mardonius died, and the Greeks breached the palisades and massacred much of the remaining Persian army. And so ended the Greco-Persian Wars. In his conclusion, Herodotus includes a complicated, ugly story, the footnote says that this tale of Xerxes' passion for Mecistus' wife gives us our last view of the hubristic king 
and in it he appears partly as the tyrant ruled by lust, and partly as the hapless victim of his own passion, who is unable to control his desires or the machinations of the one who uses them. In part, this story is a repetition of the Gyges story. Our friendly historian J.B. Burry states that the catastrophe which befalls the Persian expedition is not conceived as the work of jealous gods annoyed by the conspicuous wealth or success of mere mortals as in the Iliad. The defeat of the Persians is rather a divine punishment of the insolence and rashness that are often born of prosperity. And this is what Aeschylus says. Zeus is a judge who visits heavily all whose self-glorious spirit vaults too high. And Herodotus concludes with a flashback to the Greeks' favorite Persian, Cyrus the Great. One of his officials proposed to him, Since Zeus has given empire to the Persians, let us leave the small and barren country, and they're referring to the Persian homeland, and take possession of a richer country. Aren't we the masters of many nations in all of Asia? And Cyrus the Great replied, as great men reply, Soft countries breed soft men. Cyrus and his generation chose to rule from Persepolis, choosing to live in a rugged land and rule rather than cultivating rich plains so they could be slaves to others. And now we'll discuss the sources we used for this video. The Histories of Herodotus is a joy to read, and the books that cover the Greco-Persian War reads more like a history than his other chapters and has many entertaining stories. We left many of these stories for you to read on your own. Plutarch used Herodotus for his main source in writing the life of Themistocles, and he also discusses his childhood and his career after the war and how he had to flee to Persia and became a ruler of a satrapy in Asia Minor at the end of his life. And partially that's because Themistocles, like many of us, is a flawed character. Themistocles also has a very bad reputation for accepting bribes. And of course, uh, J.B. Burry has an excellent history on the Greek historians themselves that we discussed in a prior video. And we discussed the great courses on Herodotus in our first video on Herodotus. The YouTube description links to the video script and our blog. Please support our channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. And please click on the links for interesting videos on other topics that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.